Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith, which comes down to us from the apostles and from Jesus. And we teach and preach the Catholic faith without apology and without compromise. And we are happy to be here with you today. And we are happy that you are here with us. We have a very special guest today. His name is Peter Wolfgang. He's the director of the Family Institute of Connecticut. He holds a Juris Doctorate Uh, from the University of Connecticut School of Law and is a member of the Connecticut Bar. He also has a bachelor degree in international studies from the University, America University in Washington, D.C. So I would like to welcome to the show, Peter Wolfgang. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Brian, thank you so much for having me. Super excited that you're here today. Um, And I know that you run the Institute uh, for Family Life and you're all about family life in in many different regards. I mean, you guys focus on abortion and pro-life issues. You focus on marriage, which is being obliterated in our society. You focus on uh, religious liberty and rights. I mean, at least the way I see it, I mean, you're here in happened to me in my state, you know, the state of Connecticut, and you guys are on the front lines. You're at the the front lines of the battle, the cultural war that is going on, and um, both politically and uh, spiritually. I mean, we are a nonprofit here, so we really can't get into politics too much, but you guys do both. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about the Family Institute and what you do and what it's about? Sure. Thank you, Brian. The Family Institute was founded in uh, 1989, so we've been around for over 30 years now, and it was it were loosely affiliated with something called Focus on the Family, which is an evangelical Protestant ministry out of Colorado Springs. It was founded by Dr. James Dobson, and already by the 1970s, he was growing concerned about the crisis in uh, family life in the United States, the, the decline in marriage, of course, back then in the 70s and 80s, when we talked about a crisis in marriage, we were talking about the rising rate of divorce in the United States. Of course, in the 21st century, that problem then metastasized into other attacks on marriage. But already by the 1970s, Brian, um, you know, we had just gotten past the age of Aquarius, free love and all that, the uh, no-fault divorce revolution, had begun in the 1970s. And, you know, that was something that was sold to the public as this liberalizing reform. Everyone would be happier. You don't have to see mommy and daddy fight anymore. Kids are resilient. They'll bounce back. And uh, Dr. Dobson knew it was all a crock. He knew that the Christian biblical ethic for marriage and sexuality was what was best for people, for women and children, and also for societies. And so he took up uh, the fight. He founded Focus on the Family. By the late 1980s, it became clear to Focus on the Family that a lot of these battles were going to be won or lost at the level of states, at state capitals. So they, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) they started founding what are called Family Policy Councils, FPCs. And that's what the Family Institute of Connecticut is. We are the FPC for the state of Connecticut. And so we're sort of like the de facto local chapter of Focus on the Family. Now, I mentioned that Focus on the Family is evangelical Protestant. The Family Institute of Connecticut is not. I myself am Catholic. Um, Most of my staff is Catholic. We have one uh, evangelical on staff. And so when you mention a culture war, um, you know, there, there are generals in a war, right? I think of guys like Robbie George at Princeton University. I think of the of the late great Saint uh, Pope John Paul II. Those guys are like the generals in the war. A guy like me in Connecticut, I think of myself as like, I'm like a lieutenant leading special forces behind enemy lines because we're that's sort of where we are in Connecticut. Absolutely. That is absolutely true. I believe um, during one of the homilies that Bishop um, the bishop gave, he said that uh, Hartford was, I think, the sixth um, uh, post-Christian diocese in the country, our, our diocese of Hartford. And uh, <clears throat> he gave that, and he also sent out this booklet 
If you want to see the problems going on in the church right now, the problems going on in our society right now, people, just read the booklet that the bishop wrote because he was, everyone was going to be wondering why he went from having 212 churches in the Hartford Archdiocese to going down to about 117. And in yeah. five years, we'll have about 70. So we're, we're literally losing three quarters of our churches, Catholics and everything else. Why? He put it in the booklet. And it was very amazing to me that he said, well, we used to go, you have 85% or so at church attendance, you know, now it's less than 25. We used to have 5,000 baptisms. Now we have like a thousand. We used to have, I think 85% of all the deacons are 80 years old or older and 90% uh, and 70% and are either 90 years old or older. So like literally the future of our church in the Archdiocese of Hartford is you know, it's it's past Christian. They're done with it. Sure, there's a lot of Catholics up here. There's a lot of Christians up here, but they don't live their faith. We're post, um, I, I, he used the word post-Christian uh, age. And so I thought that was very interesting. And I didn't need him to tell me that because I live here, right? <laughs> right, right. But I, I think Archbishop Blair is dead on. I mean, that that's what I'm dealing with. I mean, you guys, you guys are dealing with the cause in a way, and I'm dealing with the effect. I'm dealing with the symptoms. Obvious, if, if we were, uh, and this is why this is why the work that that you do is so important, because the most important thing we have to do is re-evangelize the culture. Like the the Family Institute of Connecticut um, is not going to save Connecticut. Only Jesus Christ can save Connecticut. That's right. So that and that means the body of Christ. So I mean, somehow the church in Connecticut needs to be renewed. It's because of all those statistics that you just cited, quoting uh, the Archbishop of Hartford, that I'm doing, that, that the work that I do can be so challenging at times, that there's an increase in, uh, in attacks on the unborn child, on religious liberty, on marriage and the family. These are the natural consequences of, uh, of, of the decline that you're seeing. So the work that you do, are, in a way, you and I are, are very much in the same battle, um, the work that you do is very much at the heart of uh, of the things that I'm trying to fight off on the other end. Yeah, it's very interesting. And if anyone hasn't visited our channel before, and this is your first time, welcome. And uh, we don't just do YouTube here at Catholic Truth. We also have a podcast. We also have blog articles. We also do retreats and conferences and parish missions, especially teen retreats, because we want to save them before they leave, you know, and we want to fire them up in their faith. And so we reach the world. We do a lot of evangelization and apologetics. So we reach the world in many different ways. And um, one of the ways is through YouTube and having speakers on who don't do what we do and work in different ways with in, in different sides of the war. So I agree with you 100%. And uh, I used to work in public schools, you know, so I see, I had conversations every day uh, with the kids about religion, about God. And I just saw how many people have walked away. Um, what would you say is the biggest issues you see here in the state of Connecticut or just in the country at large, in our culture at large? What are some of the biggest uh, issues you see, whether it's abortion or spirituality or wh what do you fight the most? Well, I, <coughs> excuse me. I think a lot of it really does come down to that decline in faith. It's something that's been, <clears throat> excuse me, it's something that's been going on for decades now, but I do feel like it accelerated just in the last 20 years since 9-11. You know, I, I think September 11th, in some ways, uh, 2001 was a, was a turning point. On that day, uh, you know, the country reacted, or, or large portions of the country didn't look at 9-11 and say, well, that's a specific ideology that's militant Islam that attacked us on that day, and we need to do something about militant Islam. Instead, they looked at that and said, well, that's religion in general. Those are people who believe in um, religious absolutes. So we can't have absolutes of any kind. We're not allowed to believe in any sort of moral objective truth. And anyone who does is like those terrorists on 9-11. By within about three or four years, and you probably know this better than me, there was this wave of, they were called the new atheists, right? And they, yep. Richard Dawkins and all the rest, and they wrote all these um, books pushing a, a, a second wave of atheism as a fashionable thing. Some of that was was a reaction against 9-11. It was a reaction against the Bush administration, his re-election at the time. 
And, uh, you know, what we've seen is, is the culture in, in the 20 years since has only grown more dark because, I mean, when you think about it, on September 11, 2001, we didn't have um, a federal government that told nuns that they have to provide contraceptives. We didn't have same-sex marriage. We didn't have drag queen story hour in, in the public schools. This is, and we've been, we've been dealing with bad stuff for a long time, right? Abortion became legal in 1973. So we've been dealing with bad stuff for a long time, but it does feel like just in the last 20 years since 9-11, the, the crisis in faith in this country, the rise of the so-called nuns, N-O-N-E-S, young people who don't identify with organized religion at all. All of this, Brian, has had an effect on the sort of work that I do. So our job is, uh, you know, in the 1990s, when I first got involved in family work, when I was in my 20s, it was in many ways, it was a very hopeful time. It's amazing um, how much our fortunes, unfortunately, have turned in the last few years. I mean, I don't mean to sound like a downer because, I mean, one thing to bear in mind, if our fortunes can turn that quickly in one direction, they can turn just as quickly in the other direction. And I've, I've lived long enough to see that happen. So, I mean, don't don't uh, d take despair away from anything that I'm about to say. Nevertheless, we have to be realistic and have our eyes open about what's happened over the last 25 years or so. So coming out of the 1980s when I was a teenager, you know, at the end of the 80s, we had uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, the West had been triumphant over communism. Communism was a, was a great enemy of the church. We know that going back to Our Lady of Fatima, Mary herself warned us about communism. So here we are, European communism at least, collapsed at the end of the 1980s. And so we, we felt like uh, anything was possible. We had the great Pope John Paul II, and now we were going to, uh, now that we had taken care of the East, our attention was going to turn to the West. John Paul II spoke about a culture of life versus a culture of death. We, uh, he, he wrote again, he and Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict, wrote against uh, the moral relativism of that era. And now we were going to re-evangelize the West. There was going to be a new evangelization. There was going to be a new springtime uh, of faith as we entered the third millennium. It was a very, very hopeful time in the 1990s. Um, when you had uh, public examples of Catholicism, like John Paul II, like Mother Teresa, by the end of the 90s, it felt like all the ground that we had lost since the 1960s, we were on our way to getting it back and more. We were going to turn this culture around. And then what happened is you hit the 21st century. I mentioned 9-11. The next thing that happened in 2002 was inside the church, there was what's sometimes called the long Lent of 2002, right? There was a, the wave of revelations about clergy sex abuse. Mm -hmm. And so that hurt the church's credibility in the eyes of the wider public when it came to standing up for, at the time in the early 2000s, embryonic stem cells. You know, that was a big thing. There were, there were all these battles, all these sort of permutations of the fight against abortion. Uh, throughout the 90s, there had been this growing consensus among scholars of both the left and the right that the no-fault divorce revolution from the 70s had been a bad thing, that somehow we needed to uh, create, recreate a pro-marriage culture here in the United States. It was a very hopeful thing. There were major articles in like the Atlantic, liberal magazines, mainstream media publications saying with titles like Dan Quayle was right, you know, that it's wrong to, uh, to attack marriage. We need to restore marriage. But then in the 2000s, when the same-sex marriage issue arrived, like that consensus broke down, because in order to have same-sex marriage, you have to deny that children need both a mom and a dad. So that consensus of left and right to recreate marriage broke down. So there were a number of things that just suddenly went wrong when once you hit the 2000s. And so, you know, God willing, we'll get back on track. But a lot of that hopefulness from about the middle to the end of the John Paul II era I think got lost. And so the sort of work that I do, um, the challenges only grew. I was, I've been a pro-life activist uh, since the 1980s. And then in the early 2000s, when the same-sex marriage issue arrived, I recognized right away what that would mean 
for the freedom of the church and society to be able to proclaim the gospel. And of course, the things I sensed right away turned out to be true. There's a direct line from same-sex marriage to cancel culture. It, but for same-sex marriage, we would not now be living in a society where the church is being constantly harassed, told, you know, you have to uh, provide adoptions for same-sex couples or your adoption agency will close down, things like that, that are just, you know, bakers, florists being sued out of business, that, that uh, same-sex marriage, even apart from the merits of the issue itself, that marriage is between a man and a woman, that this is not in the best interest of children or society, it, it was a big idea that would have um, consequences for all of society, and it did. Religious liberty in America has never been the same since. And we see it on, on one end with the Obamacare contraceptive mandate, abortifacient mandate, and we see it on the other end with the LGBT agenda. All of this comes out of, unfortunately, the setbacks that we suffered in the early 2000s. So in the, in the, um, in the early 2000s, when I first went to work for Family Institute of Connecticut, we were very hopeful that we could stop same-sex marriage. And you know, the funny thing, Brian, is we did. We actually stopped it every yep. year at the state legislature for yep. a decade. They never passed it democratically in Connecticut. What happened was they then got the courts to impose it undemocratically. That That's happened right. in Connecticut in 2008. And then it happened on the federal level in the U.S. Supreme Court in 2015. So we actually we actually won a lot of those battles. But this is, yeah. this is something in some ways that ties in with national politics, the whole Trump phenomenon that people had developed a sense that, that this was no longer, and you and I are taping this on the birthday of, of Abraham Lincoln, that as Lincoln said, uh, this was no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, in Lincoln's famous phrase, that, that somehow our right to govern ourselves have been taken away from us. So these issues, abortion, same-sex marriage, they're very important by themselves, but they're never by themselves. They sort of affect our entire um, order as a constitutional republic in the United States and the ability of the church to have the freedom to preach the gospel. It all kind of hangs together. <laughs> I know. Whew. It's like, where do you even go from there? It's like a bomb. It's like so difficult to fight against. I mean, I, and same thing in Massachusetts, where I'm originally from. They just, the courts, some judges got together and just said, gay marriage is okay. We don't care that the people voted against it far and away, outvoted us. We're just going to put our will on the people. And that's exactly what happened. It's just despicable. You know, we're supposed to live in a land of laws and in a land of freedom and elections and fair process. And now we just have people shoving it down our throats. And this has been happening for a long time through the school systems, through the colleges. I mean, I saw it in public schools, people force liberal teachers just forcing their views on teachers. Back in the day, you used to teach kids to think for themselves. You used to teach kids to be intelligent. You used to teach them, you used to give them both sides of an argument, say, study both and be able to present both. If I give you one or the other, you should be able to present it as if you believe it. And so kids would study both sides and understand both sides. But now, they're just given the narrative. And so, of course, they're brainwashed. Of course, they don't, you know, know what they're talking about many times. And I've seen, like, in one classroom setting, I had a teacher who said, uh, we're going to discuss an opinion piece. Give us your opinion on whether you, got, you think guns should be legal or not. And he gave them a three-page uh, paper to read on whether or not... Um, you know, guns should be legal. And the whole thing was anti-gun about how guns kill people, the numbers, this, the numbers, that. And I said, your teacher is uh, a shallow thinker and he's teaching you to be a shallow thinker. He's only giving you one side of the argument, his side, and then telling you to give your opinion, which is already his. I said, that's fallacious. I said, let me give you the other side. I'm not saying I'm which side I believe, because that's irrelevant. But let me give you what the other side would say. So I gave the pro-gun side and this and that. And I said, now you have both sides. Now you can make your opinion. And I feel like our culture has been, like you said, cancel culture has been forcing their opinion down our throats. You can't preach your religion. You can't step on our toes. Stop making waves. Keep your religion in your closet. Stop preaching. But, oh, we're going to do that to you. And you know what? I was thinking about this today. Sorry, now I'm going off on a tangent. But today I was thinking that if you insult Muslims, 
You might die depending where you live, but they're definitely going to say something. And so are Jews. If you insult atheists, if you insult liberals, they're going to go crazy. But if you insult Catholics, we sit back and we take it. Sick and tired of it. We're a bunch of pushovers. We're a bunch of babies. We roll over. We're passive. We don't say anything. We don't do anything. And for too long, for the last 50 years, our culture has told us to shut up. Our culture has told us not to say anything. Don't do anything. And we haven't. And so I feel like in a lot of ways, we've allowed our culture to overrun us. <laughs> and, and, and thank God for people like you and me and the calls that God's given us. We're trying to take it back. You know, we're trying to bring truth back into this world, light back into this world, holiness back into this world. And uh, anything that's good, true and beautiful, because they are marring that as fast as humanly possible. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with everything you just said. So then the question becomes like, what is the pathway forward? And I think we just, um, <clears throat> as I said, you know, it, it really, at the end of the day, only Jesus Christ can save Connecticut, can save the world. We know that he already has, um, but we, we, wanna, we want it to reach its, its culmination, its, its fullness. I mean, um, we have to do our part to, to join in that, right? So I, I think everything comes back to um, prayer back to the sacraments, confession, making sure that we're on our game and just trying to discern God's will in doing it. And, and, and this comes back to your point, being active in these things. So for instance, and I probably should have said this uh, at the get-go, the Family Institute of Connecticut's website is ctfamily.org. That's CT as in Connecticut, ctfamily.org. And we'll and link I, that below in the show notes as well. Thank you. And, and I hope everyone watching this, listening to this, will uh, go there and sign up for our email alerts because we have so much happening in Connecticut right now. We just had a, uh, a public hearing on a bill attacking crisis pregnancy centers <clears throat> in the state of Connecticut. There are now more pregnancy resource centers, they're called, than there are abortion clinics in Connecticut. Um, abortion, the rate of abortion has actually been declining both nationally and here in Connecticut. When they awesome. first started, when the Catholic conference first started putting out an annual report, abortion was at about 15,000 a year in Connecticut. It's down to 10,000. That's still horrible. That's still 10,000 people a year being killed. But the fact that the rate is dropping is not nothing. It's good news. The lower we can get it, the better. The problem is the abortion industry in Connecticut eventually figured out that one of the reasons they're losing business is there are now more pregnancy centers in Connecticut than there are abortion clinics. So they went on the attack in the pro-abortion groups. They're called NARAL, they, they, uh, National Abortion Rights Action League. They put out this fake uh, supposed study of the clinics here in Connecticut saying that these clinics lie uh, to women and deceive them. And therefore, they need a bill at the legislature, a law um, regulating deceptive advertising practices. They have not been able to produce a single shred of evidence to back up their allegations. However, the one thing they're good at is elections. They've been able to elect a lot of their, you know, I wouldn't call them public servants, the NARAL servants. If they were really public servants, they would have listened to all this great evidence that we entered into the public record at this public hearing a few days ago. Family Institute of Connecticut's own Christina Bennett just did a, a fantastic job. So did a guy named Jeremy Bradley, who runs a uh, Caring Families Pregnancy Center out in Eastern Connecticut, and many other wonderful people too, where they were able to describe what they do. And the people on the other side were not able to offer any evidence whatsoever about their allegations that are the basis of this bill. But because NARAL was able to elect some of their people at the last election, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, 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 facts, logic, evidence, the only thing that matters up there is power. And they were able to elect some of their people. So they're gonna, they're gonna push this bill through. As you and, said, by the people, for the people, all out the window, right? Yeah, I mean, if they really were public servants, this bill would be dead after that public no. hearing. 
they're that's, public bullies and that's what we're becoming in our culture where the, the other side is becoming public bullies that hence the cancel culture if you agree with me you're wrong if you agree with me you're fi- if you disagree with me you're fired and in fact i just heard today that the girl from the mandalorian um just got fired from that show um because she ha- said was said to be a Holocaust denier. And her Twitter post had nothing to do with that. It was not denying the Holocaust. In fact, Ben Shapiro just came out. He's like, I'm a Jew, more practicing than most Jews out there. He's like, I wear the cap, like the whole thing. He's like, I'm not even remotely offended because I know that she wasn't saying what they're saying she's saying, but doesn't matter if you disagree, you lose your job. You know, it's like, it's not whether it's true or not, it's whether you agree with me or not. Yeah, I, I think that's very much what we're up against. So that's, I mean, and taking what you just said back to the pregnancy center issue, what has the other side said for 40 or 50 years now? Oh, we're not pro-abortion, we're pro-choice. You know, <laughs> if you want the choice to have an abortion, that's okay. Well, what do these pregnancy centers do? They don't even lobby against abortion. All they do is offer another choice for that's the right. women who, who uh, have their babies, you know? And so now these people... You know, we, we've come out the other end of moral relativism. Now they're back to absolutism. They, they do believe in absolutes now, because if, if you don't think so, if you work in corporate America, go down to your HR office and say, well, I know you expect me to participate in pride months, but you know, that's your truth. You have your truth and I have my truth. And my truth says that I don't have to believe in that and see how, how long you keep your job. So moral relativism, the dictatorship of relativism that Pope Benedict uh, warned us about 15 years ago. We've actually mm-hmm. moved beyond that now. Now yeah. it's just plain dictatorship. That's so right. Much relativism. Um, and, and that was always what it was softening us up for. And so now the pro-abortion people in Connecticut, they're not content with the fact that abortion has been legal for 47 years. We've not been able to repeal, or 48, we've not been able to repeal Roe versus Wade. Um, they've managed to kill 60 million people. They're not satisfied with that. Now they want to go into the pregnancy centers that were allowed to operate legally in Connecticut for 30 years and shut them down. So it it grows only more aggressive. It comes back to that cancel culture that you're talking about with the actress from The Mandalorian. They're at the point now. I mean, when I was a kid, a liberal would say, I may not agree with uh, what you say, but I die for your right to say it. We are exactly right. Yep. Now that that was only until they were in charge. Now that they're in charge, forget it. The Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution, it's all right out the window. Or the (laughs) ethic that the Constitution created in our society. That's true. And um, there's so much I want to, so many directions I could go with this. Um, But yeah, I was talking to somebody recently who said, we've definitely thrown a lot out the window, morals. I mean, even our church has thrown a lot out the windows too. I mean, I think that's a lot of the problem is that since the 1960s, we've had a lot of filth come into our church. We've had filth come into our church since the late 1800s, since the Enlightenment, and it's come down to us, but it's really kind of had a head in the 1960s and 70s. And as you had pointed out, the new age movement came about in the hippy dippy generation. In fact, we just wrote a book on uh, counterfeit spirituality, uh, exposing the false gods. And it talks about new age spirituality and how it didn't actually go away after the 70s and 80s. It evolved and became one with our culture. It became culture. So now what used to be new age and false spirituality is normal and our church embraced a lot of it. And so most Catholics can't even understand their faith. Most Catholics have not been well catechized. Most Catholics can't tell the difference between what's right and wrong, what's true and false. I mean, just look at our election and people saying that it's, they're trying to argue that it's okay to vote for Biden because he's more pro-life than Trump. I mean, just this, I can't even like well, I can't without being charitable, so I won't go there. But, um, but just a lot of cath. Uh, here, here, well, I can give you an example, local ones, from firsthand experience. Sure. Here in the state of Connecticut, here in the Archdiocese of Hartford, we have it's now it's now a magazine format, the Catholic Transcript. It was the uh, official newspaper of the Archdiocese going back to like. 1829 or something. It's like one of the oldest Catholic publications in the United States. And um, 
I can tell you in the early 90s, when I was in my early 20s, you would open up the Catholic transcript. This is, they eventually did away with all this. You know, they, they, um, they buttoned down and they cleaned up things. But I can tell you in the early 1990s, they had like the events page was called date book, right? You would go to the date book page of the Catholic transcript in the early 1990s and tons of advertising for workshops in Catholic churches throughout Connecticut for the Enneagram, for centering prayer, for all, all sorts of stuff that was later condemned by the church, all sorts of new agey practices. There was like, I mean, already by the early 2000s, I think a lot of that stuff was gone. But in the early 90s, I mean, there was some crazy, crazy stuff that would be advertised in the Catholic transcript. And that wasn't just in the 90s. It was before that as well, just in different practices. But now, I mean, yeah, so we talk about that in our new book, Counterfeit Spirituality. Mm -hmm. You can buy it on Amazon, our Sunday Visitor, where it's published. We talk about the Enneagram. We talk about centering prayer, yoga, Reiki, mindfulness, uh, acupuncture, uh, Zen and Oriental meditation, astrology and the occult. Um, I mean, Reiki is one of the biggest things, but one of the fastest growing practices in our country. We have nuns practicing Reiki, of priests practicing Reiki. You have priests practicing Zen and claiming to be good Catholics. And you have these things infested at Catholic retreat houses. I mean, they're all over. And that's why I wrote my book is because I went to Catholic retreat houses and Catholics just sat there taking it and they couldn't even tell the difference that this was Looney Tune, not Catholicism, not spiritual, not from God leading the other direction. And um, I think since the 1960s, we've had a huge problem in our church, especially when the church was so hijacked by liberals and modernists, and they pushed their agenda in the seminaries and from the seminaries into colleges and universities and into school systems, religious education. They literally hijacked so much of the church. And so we're just I'm catching up. And this is a lot of where Catholic truth comes in. A lot of priests will not preach the truth. A lot of bishops will not preach the truth. And worse, they confuse people with things that aren't true or just liberal garbage that's not true and what the Catholic Church doesn't teach. And so we are here to teach and preach the truth. We don't need to make it up. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to uh, try to figure it out. It's already been here for 2000 years. Jesus Christ is God. He is the truth. He gave it to us. The Catholic Church protected it for 2000 years and you're going to try to change it. And yeah, sure. We had 50,000 nuns leave the church in 10 years from 1966 to 1976, but we had so many thousands more stay in the church to try to change it in a, a, this kind of new age anarchy philosophy eroded the foundations of our church and that is exactly what we are fighting against here at catholic truth we're here to re-catechize our church re-instruct our church reprogram the church with the truth that's been here for two thousand years and quite frankly it's so needed as you said with the new atheists coming in the cancel culture coming in with teens losing their faith and walking away more than ever before it's I mean, on all sides, it's like a war, but you know what? That's why we started this because we're going to war. You know, it's like Jesus is our leader and whether we get destroyed or not in the process, we're going to war and we're taking it back for our Lord Jesus. I'll tell you, I'm grateful <clears throat> that we have the bishops we do here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I, can, I can think of certain dioceses around the country and I, I'd be happy to name them. Newark, New Jersey, San Diego, <laughs> Chicago. Um, we have we have much better bishops here yeah. in Hartford and Bridgeport, for yeah. which I am deeply, deeply grateful compared to uh, those other places that I mentioned. But and, you know, I, I tend to mention the 90s. You're right. It goes back to the 60s. I mentioned the 90s because I'm Generation X. And that's like the, it's about the 90s, my first decade of adulthood, I think where I, I had too. personal experience of these things. And, and so I can tell you stories. Even though the bishops here in Connecticut were always relatively um, solid, you think of like one of the one of the um, criticisms <clears throat> that you hear in the political arena these last five years is the phrase "deep state." That there was a deep state inside the federal government that resisted President Trump and tried to undermine him from within. By analogy, I think you could say that there's a, a deep church. You know, there's like these middle management. Uh, employees inside the institutional church that a lot of times I think were undermining John Paul II, Benedict mm -hmm. XVI, Absolutely. even Absolutely. Our, our bishops here in Connecticut. And so like the great message that you're, that you were preaching that you just mentioned and that we've, we've been hearing from Rome 
uh, for 35 years really did not reach the people in the pews. That's that's what I feel like I've seen to some extent with my own eyes locally here sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And a false message many times is has reached the people in the pews. You know, they didn't like Humani Vitae and many liberals and modernists and theologians who wanted to dissent on the moral issues hated, hated Humani Vitae. And that's, I think, is when a lot of the war within the Catholic Church started. A lot of this, as they said, Everything the smoke of Satan. 1968. Yeah. 1968, I think, is right up there with 1517. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> where things just kind of broke apart, and we've been trying to put it back together ever since. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And even back then, they were telling the people, they were take bishops were, uh, not, uh, not bishops, theologians and moral, moral theologians were taking polls and signing all these people up and saying, oh, we don't agree with the Pope. We think the church is wrong. I mean, if you're telling the people that the church can be wrong, that's going to send a message to the people. And if you're telling the people just to follow their own conscience, don't listen to the men in Rome. I mean, why do you think we have such an anti-Catholic culture within our church? You know, that I don't need, I don't, choose to believe that. I don't need to believe that. Well, I personally believe this. Well, who cares what you personally believe? You're not God. You don't make the rules. You don't make anything. You just obey or not. There's a sand and there's a line in that sand and you take a side. That's really what it comes down to. And we're not afraid to preach the truth here. Of course, we want to always do so of love um, because many people just don't know they've been lied to and they've been misled. They've been brainwashed uh, by people who are supposed leaders in the church. I mean, you have pre priests preaching Reiki and yoga and not just yoga like, oh, it's just exercise, but yoga like you can achieve divination and you know become one with God through this spiritual Hindu practice. It's like not even like, just exercise they're preaching like the full thing and it's out of control yeah I, <clears throat> back to your point about people inside the church i'm reminded of an incident a couple years ago out in san francisco where archbishop uh cordelioni he wanted the catholic mm -hmm. schools the teachers yes. there, to, like sign a document saying you know i'm going to adhere to catholic sexual morality we're going to teach according to what the church actually teaches on this. And it was actually the lady, this is how far gone we were, where we had a good bishop trying to do the right thing. And uh, it was actually the the lady that, um, it was actually the lady that tried, that uh, resisted him. Yeah. Yeah, it, they chewed him out. I mean, they oh. basically, all of hell broke loose against that man. So praise God that he's still the way he is and many priests orthodox priests who are preaching the truth get uh yelled at today too but um a lot of catholics are concerned just changing gears here a lot of catholics are concerned about the future of our church especially with a so-called catholic like biden who's either very evil or very confused um you know because he supports a lot of things that the Catholic Church doesn't support, and not just any things, some of the biggest issues in the church, some of them caught, um, carrying with them automatic excommunications, depending you know, if you get involved with them. Uh, so some of these things are big, and not yet we have a Catholic president who is pro-abortion, pro-contraception, gay marriage, and other things. So what do you think about that? And what do you think uh, might be some of the consequences we're going to see as a church and a society, uh, possibly in the near future or down the line? Well, I, I think the Biden presidency is a lot of chickens coming home to roost for the Catholic church, unfortunately, for the mm -hmm. bishops um, too. And, you know, one of the reasons why the Obama administration, I think, in the year 2012, thought they could get away with the contraceptive mandate with imposing that on the Catholic church was uh, in a lot of parts of the church, the church really hadn't been teaching you Manny Vitae anyway. Uh, the church had been looking the other way. I mean, it, it's there, it's official teaching, it's on paper, but you, you really, I mean, with a few exceptions like John Paul II, you really weren't hearing a lot about the church's teaching on birth control in natural family planning and all that, it kind of gave the sense that the church doesn't really believe this. We say we believe it, but we don't really believe it. As with um, Obamacare and contraception, so I think with President Biden, uh, you know, if, if we really believe that abortion is what we say it is, and if we really believe that the Eucharist is what we say it is, 
we we would have cracked down on guys like him 40 or 50 years ago. We wouldn't we wouldn't be faced and if we did, we wouldn't be faced with this problem that we now have. And I think what I find especially disturbing is that there was a period there where the church seemed to understand that where the church actually seemed to be uh get getting its mojo back. And so about the year 2004 we had another pro-abortion Catholic who was running for president by the name of John Kerry. And uh, the, the, all of a sudden, bishops, for the first time, were publicly uh, calling out a, a pro-abortion politician, a, a very high prominent politician, John Kerry, and saying, if you come to my diocese, you can't take communion here. And there was a very big discussion about it. There was a letter from Cardinal Ratzinger to the U.S. bishop saying, yes, you, you should deny a person like that communion. Yeah. Exactly. And the bishops were really on top of it in 2004, frankly. And that continued for a while. I remember in 2009 when uh, President Obama went to speak at Notre Dame and he got he got an award, I think, from the school. There was something like 60 bishops in the United States that protested that. Like, I think the vast majority of the bishops in the USA actually protested Notre Dame giving an award to Obama. And me, as a, as a guy who's in my late 30s at that point, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, boy, if this had happened in the 80s, Cardinal O'Connor of New York probably would have been out there by himself. He would have been the only one. And maybe Archbishop Rembert Weakland of Milwaukee would have written a, a letter in the New York Times criticizing the Bishop of New York for it. Now in 2009, you actually have dozens of bishops publicly speaking against Obama doing that. So it, it seemed to me that the John Paul II and Benedict era was having an effect in that the Episcopate, the U.S. bishops here in the United States, they were getting better and better in 2004, 2009. But now in 2021, I think we may have reached our height at that and, and something started to go wrong in the other direction. And we're not seeing as much of that uh, in 2021 as I think we saw in the 2000s. You did see a little bit though, and this is very interesting, that the USCCB put out a statement the day um, that Biden was inaugurated and Archbishop Gomez put out a great statement. It was yeah. not uh, an overly harsh statement. There was like one line in there that criticized him on abortion, but you saw Cardinal Supic uh, freak out over it. And so there, there's something going on inside the Bishop's Conference. I would still say I think the Bishops' Conference overall is a much better Bishops' Conference than it was in like the 1980s when I was a teenager. But you, you can tell that we're headed into interesting times where I think the bishops are going to start to have this fight in public for everyone to see. And that may be a good and necessary thing. And I imagine, you know, that we can count on our bishops here in Connecticut to push back against the Cardinal Supiches. Yeah, I don't know if the bishops arguing in public will be good or not. I guess we'll have to see about that. But, um, you know, it definitely leads to confusion, which is why uh, both of us exist to tell the truth of what the Catholic Church teaches, whether people, including bishops, agree with it or not. And bishops can be wrong. And uh, so I think it's going back to um, you had said something about um, the pregnancy centers. I think we just did a video on pro-life, uh, like a couple of videos ago on our YouTube channel. And, um, sister Joan Chitterson is one of the, is famous for saying, you know, you're not pro-life, you're pro-baby, you're pro-birth. You know, you just want babies to be born. And we blew apart that objection, just showing how pregnancy centers actually give women help, you know, and this it's the pro-life, uh, centers around the country that give them money or carriages or housing or uh, emotional help, uh, retreats for healing. I mean, and almost everything you can imagine, they give them help. Whereas Planned Parenthood never offers money, doesn't give them help, barely lets them stay in the room for 10 minutes while they're hurting before they kick them out. And they don't give them anything where it's the pro-life organizations around the country that are really, truly helping people. And um so really, it's, I think it's a great evil, the fact that they're trying to get rid of them, trying to just remove them, you know, just because it threatens their power, or not even their power, just their ability to make money, not enough abortions, you know, whatever the case is. Um, is that kind of what you see as well? Yes. In fact, two days ago in um, Hartford at the public hearing, well, 
in Hartford virtually because of COVID, everything's on Zoom right now. But um, two days ago at the public hearing of the Public Health Committee for the Connecticut State Legislature, it was a 12 hour hearing. Almost wow. there was something like 81 people who testified. The vast majority, something like 70 of them, all on our side in favor of the pregnancy centers, wow. against the bill. And they all testified along the lines of what you just said, Brian. Some people actually had, some of the women who testified actually had firsthand experiences with Planned Parenthood uh, and with the abortion clinics and could, and could speak about how poorly they were treated there compared to how they were treated by the pregnancy centers who gave them the help they needed. There was one woman, this poor woman, she had had three abortions. I mean, she had a rough life and somehow she came out of it. She found her way to the pregnancy center and she could describe from firsthand experience the difference between the pregnancy center and the abortion clinic. And it's exactly what you just described. Wow. Um, real quick, uh, before we finish up, I just have one quick question for you, but in case anyone's wondering, you can go check out that, um, video we have, it's called answering the top 10 pro-choice arguments. Um, we also have a video called Catholic crisis. Uh, if you're interested in more of what we've been talking about here in the crisis in the church, and we also have a video, you know, because we would be remiss to say this, but we also have a video called hope for the Catholic Church and all the good things that are happening, all the renewals that are happening, great institutes and great work like Peter Wolfgang is doing, uh, Catholic Answers, EWTN, I mean, reform from the ground up. I mean, we say, we're saying that all the book, uh, many of the book companies in the Catholic Church were liberal. Many of the Catholic schools went liberal, I mean, and worse. Um, <clears throat> many of the media went liberal, but now that's all being reformed. It's uh, seminaries for the most part have been reformed. So a lot of great things are happening in the Catholic Church. And I think we're going in a good direction. But um, let me, I, I just wanted to throw that out to it for our viewers, but I want to ask you one last question. What do you think, what do you see in the near future for our religious liberty uh, and uh, taking away of our free speech and things like that? Oh, I think we're in huge trouble. Um, President Biden has vowed to reignite the attack on the little sisters of the poor. The little sisters of the poor are really a stand-in for all of us who are believers. I mean, they want to take those poor nuns, and we have them in Enfield, Connecticut, by the way. They're right here in our state. They want to take those poor nuns back to court and force them to be complicit in providing contraceptives and abortion-inducing drugs against their will, which is, you know, in the entire history of our republic, there has never been a federal assault on religious liberty of the kind that we've had now just in the last 10 years with the Obamacare mandate. And it was a mandate. It wasn't even something that Congress agreed to. It was something that uh, one, of the, one of the executive agencies just came up with afterwards and said, surprise, this is what Obamacare means. So Obama wants, or excuse me, President Biden wants to do that. They wanna get rid of the Hyde Amendment and force us to, bad enough abortions legal, they want to force us all to pay for it. Um, President Biden, this may actually be the tip of the spear uh, in terms of the attacks that are coming on religious liberty. President Biden is passionately in favor of transgenderism. And his, uh, the, the second in command that he has installed at Health and Human Services, the guy at the top is a, is a vehement culture warrior against people like us. The number two is actually a person who is transgendered, a, a, a biological male who considers himself a woman. And uh, I mean, we, we saw this at the end of the Obama administration where they sent out a letter to the public schools saying, you have to allow um, boys to shower with girls if they think they're girls, otherwise you're not getting your federal funding. All of that is coming back and more. There was a ruling from the Supreme Court, uh, Bostock, that actually may aid the, the transgender agenda and aim it more specifically at the churches. We don't understand yet what the uh, what the ultimate effect of Bostock or Bostock will be. And um, so I, I think we've got, in the near term, I think we have significant trouble coming our mm. way on religious liberty. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. And uh, it's very scary. And if people are concerned about this, if you're worried about our future, I mean, liberal Catholics who vote for Biden or were justifying their votes, they're not worried because they're throwing their towel in. But, you know, for people who are like serious 
uh, I don't want to say serious Catholics because they'd consider themselves serious Catholics, but for people who are for the pro-life cause, whole heart across the board, um, who are for religious liberty. And I warned people that Catholic, uh, that Biden's not a real Catholic. He will take away your religious liberty. He will force those poor little nuns to try to provide abortions and other people too. I mean, who does that in good conscience if you believe in God? So, um, there's, uh, so we have a video called um, Thoughts on the Election, and we talk about that. They're comforting thoughts that Jesus is Lord, Jesus wins, Jesus um, has everything in control, and we are on his side. So uh, I want to thank you, Peter, for joining us today. I want to encourage people to go check out your institute. I'm going to link it down below. Check out all the work that they do. Check out the articles they have. Stay updated on what they do. And check out our videos and podcasts as well so you can be informed in your own Catholic faith. So uh, thank you, Peter. We really appreciate you being here with us today. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And God bless you. And God bless all the work that you're doing and uh, all the people that you're helping. And just God protect you on those front lines with all that you're doing and the ministry that you're working. Thank you, Brian. Amen. God bless. And thank you all for joining us today on the Catholic Truth Podcast. And uh, please continue to join us. If you love what we do, please consider supporting our ministry. Uh, you can see that in the link below. Also follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else will be in the show notes below. God bless you all. As always, we will be praying for you. Please pray for us as well. God bless. Thank you, Peter.